Okay, we'll uh, get started. So the most awaited time for this semester is here. Assignment one is on Carmen. I'm sure you all have been waiting for this day, so didn't want to hold you off any longer. Assignment is due next Monday. Uh, I personally prefer writing on paper, but I know many of you would prefer writing it on iPad or whatever, tablet device, and submit the homework so you can use whatever you want. You can either submit it on Carmen or you can submit it in class. So if you have a paper copy, you can submit it in class. Otherwise, you can submit it on Carmen. Uh, the deadline is 12.30 next Monday, so exactly before the class. So either you submit it in class or you can just submit it online. That's completely fine, but do it before the deadline, which is next Monday, right before this class. Okay, so uh, we've been diving into the world of optimization algorithms. Specifically, we are looking at unconstrained optimization, and we are looking for algorithms to solve unconstrained optimization. Uh, so today we'll uh, delve deeper into it. So keep your oxygen masks on. And then uh, we'll start with uh, an example. And then we'll move on to least square problem. So the example is as follows. I have a function f of x It's a quadratic function. B is just a vector in Rn. And Q is a positive definite matrix. Q is a positive definite matrix in n cross n. OK, so this is a convex function. Why is this a convex function? Can someone tell me from the definition of convexity? Why should this function be convex? Why should this function f be convex? So let's look at the first and second derivative. Remember, we have two, uh, like the definition of convex function. Uh, we know that if the second derivative is positive definite, then the function is convex. So what's the first derivative? Uh, so first derivative of this function is qx plus b. And the second derivative is actually q. So the, the way you get the first derivative is you have half of qx. Uh, and then because you're, uh, you are uh, uh, taking the derivative with respect to this x transpose, and then you are taking derivative with respect to x, and then you get another q transpose x. But because q and q transpose are the same, it's a positive definite matrix, so it's symmetric. You get actually qx. So half of qx plus half of qx plus b. So that gives you qx plus b. And then I take the second derivative and I get q. And second derivative is strictly positive, definite. So therefore, this is a convex function. What do we know about convex functions? What's the necessary and sufficient condition for optimality? Yeah. Yeah, the first derivative is 0 at the optimal point. So I have that qx star plus b equals to 0, which means x star is equal to minus q inverse b. That is my optimal solution. So I can actually compute the optimal solution by hand. I don't have to do any fancy stuff here. Now let's look at what happens when we apply gradient descent method and the Newton's method onto this particular problem. So if I want to get to this particular point, q minus q inverse b, how do I use the gradient descent method to converge here? So in gradient descent method, I have xk minus alpha k uh, 
steepest descent. So sorry, I, I didn't mean. I'm looking at the steepest descent method. So this is my steepest descent method. I can rearrange the terms to get Any question on this part? Okay, so we get I minus alpha k q x k minus alpha k b. That just comes from rearranging this particular term here. Uh, let's for simplicity sake assume that alpha is constant. Okay, so I am not changing alpha k with time. Alpha k is equal to alpha. So then I get x k plus 1 equals to i minus alpha q x k minus alpha b. That is what I get. When is the sequence supposed to converge? What do we know from linear algebra? Not sure if any of you have studied this in linear algebra or not. So under what conditions, so look at the sequence, right? So this particular sequence has a specific functional form. The sequence can be written as xk plus 1 equals to axk plus b. Not the same b as that b. Uh, or let me, let me call it by a different name. Uh, we have not used c yet, so let me call it c. So when does this sequence converge? Has anyone studied this before? When does a sequence of this type converge? Let's look at it in the simplest case. So this is all scalar. So I have xk plus 1 equals to axk plus c. This is all scalar. When will the sequence converge? Let us uh, try to figure it out. So I have x1 equals to a x0 plus c, x2 equals to a square x0 plus a c plus c, x3 equals to Okay, so this is what I'm getting. What should I do now? What should I do next? I want to figure out where this x1, x2, x3, where is the sequence converging? I see a pattern there. What is the pattern? Xn equals to? a raised to k, k equals 0 to n minus 1. Does this look correct? Okay, let me write it on the other side. I am writing the same expression here. K equals 0 to n minus 1. 
a raised to k c. When is this sequence going to converge to a specific value? Some finite number, it has to be some finite number and what is that finite number? Any idea? So I have this a raised to n term which gets multiplied with the initial condition. So my initial condition could be anything on the real axis. Uh, so if a is greater than 1, what is going to happen to this term? Infinity. It's going to become infinity, right? As n goes to infinity. So a must be less than 1, right? So between minus 1 and 1. So then this particular term is going to go to 0. It also turns out that if a is less than 1, this series is going to converge. This is a geometric series. So if a is less than 1, then x infinity is 0 plus 1 over 1 minus a times c. Does that make sense? So if absolute value of a is less than 1, then actually x, xn converges to x infinity, which is c over 1 minus a. Okay, everyone agrees with this? Agrees with this uh, assertion? Perfect. So we have the we have the uh, vector counterpart of this particular statement on that side. So now that we know that for a is strictly less than 1, uh, this thing converges. How do I find out by looking at this particular expression? So I'm going to take the limit k goes to infinity on both sides. So I have x infinity equals to a x infinity plus c. That gives me x infinity o o x infinity equals to c over 1 minus a. Okay, but just by taking the limit I get this expression. So I don't have to do very complicated, like of course I did a lot of complicated math, figured out a, a, a way to write xn and then if a is less than 1, I took the geometric series and I got this particular expression. But it turns out there is an easier way, as long as we impose this condition that a is less than 1, I can take the limit k goes to infinity on both sides and I get this particular expression. Now the vector counterpart of this argument basically states that if the spectral radius of A, remember we talked about spectral radius which is the maximum of the absolute eigenvalues of A, absolute of eigenvalues of A. Uh, so if spectral radius is less than 1, then this particular sequence converges. So I'll write it as a fact. And uh, if you take a course in linear systems theory, then this is something that is proven in those courses. So we are not going to do the proof here, but the proof argument is essentially the same as what I have mentioned here. So if spectral radius of A is less than 1, then xk plus 1 equals to axk plus c converges to Uh, x infinity i minus a inverse c, which is exactly the expression there. <coughs> so if the spectral radius of a is less than 1, then this particular sequence I have mentioned here converges to i minus a inverse c. Okay, any question so far? Too many questions, I don't know where to start from. <laughs> <laughs> what questions do you have? 
No, but after the class. Okay. Okay. So he has too many questions, but he'll ask me after the class. Okay. <laughs> Devoiding you of the sea of knowledge, he's going to just <laughs> store for himself. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So uh, I know that this particular sequence is going to converge to this particular value. Now I have a sequence, the same sequence here. Under what conditions is the sequence going to converge? Well, if the spectral radius of this matrix is less than one, and when will the spectral radius of this matrix be less than one? So remember, Q is a positive definite matrix. What's the eigenvalues of this particular matrix? So it turns out that if you have identity matrix minus whatever, some other matrix, then the eigenvalues is 1 minus the eigenvalue of this particular matrix. So the eigenvalues are 1 minus alpha lambda 1, 1 minus alpha lambda 2, 1 minus alpha lambda n. So that's the eigenvalue of this matrix. And I need to pick alpha. Remember, alpha is a free parameter. I can pick alpha as I want. Uh, so I can pick an alpha sufficiently small. So if alpha is small, 1 minus alpha lambda 1 is less than 1. 1 minus, remember, lambda 1, lambda 2, all of these are strictly greater than 0. So I can pick alpha small so that this is less than 1, this is less than 1, all of these are less than 1. So I get the spectral radius is less than 1. And then this particular sequence would converge to something. So what is that something? What is this sequence going to converge to? Let's uh, write it on this side. Can someone tell me what is the sequence going to converge to? If I pick alpha sufficiently small, the spectral radius will be less than 1. Yes? Alpha Q inverse times B. OK, perfect. So my x infinity will be i minus i minus alpha Q inverse minus alpha b, right? This is plus c, right? So I have minus alpha b here. So I'll put a minus on this side. And then I'll put alpha b on this side. So let's see what this turns out to be. Minus alpha q inverse alpha b which is equal to minus q inverse b, which seems to match the result that we got here. So we took a detour, short detour into linear systems, but then we came back to the original point. This is my function. I want to optimize this function. Uh, this is a convex function because I know that Q is positive definite by construction. Uh, so I can set the first derivative to be equal to zero. Remember for convex function, the necessary and sufficient condition for optimality is that the first derivative be equal to zero. So I set the first derivative to zero and I get X star equals to Q inverse B. Now the question was, can I get the steepest descent algorithm? Can I construct a steepest descent algorithm that converges to this particular point. Turns out that if I pick alpha sufficiently small so that the spectral radius of this matrix is less than 1, then the steepest descent converges to x infinity, which is exactly the optimal point for the convex function. The rate at which this uh, algorithm would converge, if you can notice, depends on the spectral radius of A. So if A is, 
if the spectral radius of A is close to 1, so let's say 0 0.99, then the convergence is going to be slow. If the spectral radius of A is 0 0.5, this convergence to x infinity is going to be very fast. Okay, so the smaller the spectral radius, the faster the, the algorithm is going to converge. So the same statement applies here as well. The smaller the uh, spectral radius of this matrix, the faster this algorithm will converge to the optimal point which is minus Q inverse B. Okay. Uh, so what I'm saying is, how quickly this XK converges to X infinity, right? So maybe uh, X10 is very close to X infinity, within like 10 raised to minus 10, or whether X1 million is close to X infinity, within a tolerance of 10 raised to minus 10. So that actually depends on how close the spectral radius is to zero. So if the spectral radius of A is closer to zero, it converges very fast. It will converge within 10 step, 15 step, 20 step. If the spectral radius of A is very large, close to one, 0 0.99 or 0 0.999, it's going to take a much, much large number of, like it's going to take a large number of iterations to converge to X infinity. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say here. And it turns out in this case, by, by an appropriate choice of alpha, you can actually get, uh, you can get some optimal spectral radius uh, and that will converge fastest to the X infinity. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. We are not going into the rate of convergence issues right now. We, we are not going to talk about it in this uh, semester. Uh, maybe I'll talk about it later, but uh, but I just wanted to point out this fact that by an appropriate choice of alpha, you can make the algorithm fast or you can make the algorithm slow. So let's say you pick alpha equals to 0 0.01. The algorithm is going to be slow. It's going to take 1,000 iterations to converge to Q inverse B. On the other hand, if alpha equals to 0 0.5, and depending on the eigenvalues of Q, you can get to X star in like 10 or 15 iterations. So it really depends on how you how judiciously you can pick alpha uh, in order to converge to the optimal solution. Uh, whenever in practical optimization problems, if you have to pick a constant step size, you typically have to do a lot of trial and error to figure out under what, for what alpha it's going to converge quickly. So in the early days, uh, let's say this is the first time you're solving an optimization problem, you will pick alpha equals to 0 0.01. You will run the algorithm, see how the error is converging, and then you are like, no, it's converging too slowly. Then you will increase it to 0 0.02, and then you will see it's converging even more slowly. Then you will reduce it to 0 0.005, and then you will try to see like what the convergence behavior for different values of alpha is, and then you will pick an appropriate value of alpha. But it's, it's a difficult choice. Uh, how you pick alpha in practical optimization problems, it's called what is known as a hyperparameter for the optimization problem. And finding the right hyperparameter or finding the right alpha is actually a difficult problem in general optimization algorithms. In some special cases, you can find it out uh, by hand. And we'll cover some of those examples in the subsequent lectures. Yes? For this type of problems, is it possible to get an idea for the greater than one? Uh, you can. So if you pick alpha very high, so let's look at an example. So let's say the eigenvalue, so Q is 2 cross 2 matrix, and lambda 1 equals to 1, lambda 2 equals to 100. Okay, now my goal is to find a value of alpha so that the eigenvalue is of this particular matrix is going to be less than one. So what alpha should I pick? <coughs> so let's pick alpha equals to 0 0.01. So what is one minus alpha lambda one? One minus alpha lambda two. What is this equal to? Zero. 
So 0 0.01 multiplied by 100 is 1. So 1 minus 1 equals to 0. So I get 2. So this eigenvalue is very high, close to 1. So what alpha should I pick? Five, should we pick that? Let's see what happens when I pick alpha equals to 0 0.05. So this is, the spectral radius is still less than one because this is the spectral radius, 0 0.99. So it's still less than one. I'm picking, I'm increasing the value of alpha a little bit. So one minus alpha lambda one is, how much is that? 0 0.95, one minus alpha lambda two, minus 4. What's the spectral radius here? 4, right? Because it's the absolute value of, maximum of the absolute value of two eigenvalues. So spectral radius is 4. If you pick alpha equals to 0 0.05, your algorithm is going to escape to infinity. So you're not going to converge to anything. What other thing can I try? So this one, this one converges, this one does not converge. Let's pick alpha equals to 0 0.0. I'm being very judicious here. So now I've picked 0 0.015, one minus alpha lambda 1, what is this equal to? 0 0.985, 1 minus alpha lambda 2, minus 0 0.5. So this is also spectral radius is less than 1, okay? But it turns out the spectral radius here is less than the spectral radius here. So this algorithm is actually going to converge very quickly. Okay, so that's how you figure out what is going to converge quickly and what is going to converge slowly. So this is going to diverge. This is going to converge slowly. This is going to converge comparative to this. This algorithm is better. By, for this particular value of alpha, this algorithm is going to be better. Okay, so this is how through trial and error you find out what's an appropriate alpha. Uh, of course, in this case, I've given you the eigenvalues of Q matrix, but in general, you probably will not have eigenvalues of the Q matrix unless you have actually constructed the Q matrix yourself. So anyway, sometimes it's difficult, sometimes it's easy. Uh, your life will always be difficult, okay? It's only the algorithm whose implementation might be easy or difficult. Okay. And the worst thing is sometimes your supervisors might tell you that, oh, why is the algorithm not converging fast? The problem sometimes is this kind of situation where no matter what alpha you pick, the eigenvalues are gonna be close to one. Okay, so the reason I picked two extreme eigenvalues here was to show you this scenario where for a large choice of uh, alpha, your eigenvalues are still going to be, or your spectral radius is still going to be close to one. Okay, that happens in these kind of situations when the eigenvalues of Q matrix are la far apart. Okay, uh, so this is the steepest descent algorithm. Let's look at what happens when we apply the Newton's method. Yes. Yes. No, so this is only one of the component is zero. One of the eigenvalues is zero. The other one is still present, right? So when the other one is present, only one of the terms will become zero. The other term will still be there. So xk need not necessarily be equal to zero, okay? Awesome. Is it possible to have different alpha for different eigenvalues? Uh, 
So that is the that is the diagonally scaled Newton's method. So if you can pick a dk, you can pick a dk here, which is one and one over hundred, and then you can you can correct for this particular error. Yeah, you can bring the eigenvalues closer together. So that's where the diagonally scaled steepest descent. That's why we had that problem, or had that value of dk. So anyway, those are the, all the design parameters that you have at your disposal, and you can use them to improve the convergence speed of the algorithm. So I'm going to talk about Newton's method now. So I have to have second derivative inverse uh, so I have to have second derivative inverse the first derivative that gets multiplied by alpha k so that's my Newton's method can someone help me what this value is going to be Second derivative inverse, so second derivative is Q. So I should have Q inverse, and this is QXK plus B. What does this boil down to? So this is 1 minus alpha k x k minus, okay, I'll probably write it elsewhere. What should I pick alpha k to be equal to? Sorry? If I pick alpha k to be equal to 1, what happens to the Newton's method? We converge to the optimal solution in one time step. Okay. So when you are closer to the optimal solution, so this holds for any optimization problem. When you are close to the optimal solution, let's say you use steepest descent to get closer to the optimal solution. You apply Newton's method with alpha k equals to 1 or something that is close to 1. You converge very, very fast to the optimal solution. So for quadratic problem, with alpha k equals to 1, Newton's method converges in a single time step. You don't have to do anything else. Okay, no, no further iterations required. That's just the property of the second, sorry, uh, quadratic functions where Newton's method converges very quickly. But in other cases, 
Also, when you are closer to the optimal solution, Newton's method converges extremely fast. When you are far away, you need to have smaller values of alpha. You can't take alpha k equals to 1 when you are far away from the optimal solution in general case. OK. So I hope that uh, elucidates how uh, the gradient, steepest descent, and Newton's method, and everything in between. So for everything in between, you will replace this with an appropriate matrix. right? And then uh, you will compute the rest of the expression, and then you will write a code which carries out this iteration based on the alpha k that you have picked. OK. So that concludes the, uh, the examples. Now I want to move on to least square problem. So any question on this before I raise everything on the board? No? Perfect. So I have a least square problem. So how, what is least squares problem? I have gi that maps r into r. And I want to minimize f of x equals to summation of g i of x square i equals 1 to capital N. I want to minimize x in R n. So I'm going to define a matrix g of x. OK. So I can also write it as second, second uh, two norm of gx square, because the, both of them will give me the same, same expression. OK. So the question is, I want to solve this particular problem. So like always, let's try to find out what the first derivative and second derivative of this function f of x is. What is the first derivative of the function? It's summation i equals 1 to n. Oh, I need to put a half here. Please make a note there is a half multiplied to this expression. There is a half here, and then there is a half here. Remember, gi of x is a scalar. gi of x is a scalar. And the gradient of gi is a vector. Oh, this is capital N here. So this is the vector in Rn. Sorry, you said gi is a scalar and the gradient is a gi is a scalar. And the gradient of gi is a vector. So this is in R and this is in Rn. So I multiply the vector with a scalar and sum it all up. I get the derivative of the function fx. I can also write it in the, I can write it in a vector format as follows. This is gradient of g of x 
times g of x. Remember, g is defined in this way. So this is the vector way of, this is a matrix. This is a matrix in R n cross capital N. This is a matrix in R n. So I get a vector in R n. Uh, so basically, remember this is a square, right? So g i square. This is g i square x. So there will be two here which gets cancelled with this one half. Any other question? No? Okay. Now the question is what's the second derivative of the function? Let's see. So if you carefully look at the derivative of this function, it's a multiplication of two functions. So the derivative with respect to gi will go first, and then the gix will remain the same, and then you will take the second derivative with respect to gradient of, I mean the derivative with respect to the gradient of gi. I can again write it in the vector format. Okay, so you are now responsible for solving this, coming up with an algorithm for this least square problem where I want to minimize half of the norm of gx square. Uh, we've computed the first derivative, we've computed the second derivative of the function f. Uh, now the goal is to come up with an algorithm. So let's apply Newton's method. That will be xk plus 1 equals to xk minus alpha, this whole matrix inverse, oh, uh, I probably should also have alpha k here. And if I look at the steepest descent, I have xk plus 1 equals to xk minus alpha k. So as you are noting it down, I want you to recall our previous discussion today that Newton's method is fast, steepest descent is slow, right? Uh, you're responsible for coming up with an algorithm. Ideally, you want a fast algorithm. So we want to do something which is closer to Newton's method. 
so let's look at what all things we need to do in order to compute the descent direction. So what all things do I need to compute? I need to compute the gradient of g of x. I need to compute g of x gradient of g, but I've already computed it there. Gradient of g transpose, that's also something I've computed. gi of x, I have computed it here. And then I have second derivative of gi of x, and I need to compute this particular term. OK. I want you to be lazy. I want you to be fast but lazy. OK, you have two requirements. I want a fast algorithm. But I'm lazy, I don't want to compute too many things. So what term should I drop in the Newton's method while retaining the, yeah? The summation, the summation term. And why do you want to omit this particular term? Because you have to compute the second derivative. I have to compute the second derivative of each of these capital N number of functions. So the first derivative, I have to compute anyways, because it's a gradient method. The function evaluation I have to compute anyways because it, that's required for computing the gradient. This term I have for free. This gradient of g, gradient of g transpose, I have it for free because I've already computed this. And matrix multiplication is not that difficult. But the second derivative is something that I can try to avoid computing because I know that this is also a symmetric matrix. And this is actually positive semi-definite in general case, but it can be positive definite if uh, all the, if, if the first, if this particular matrix is full rank, then this particular matrix is going to be, uh, uh, this matrix is going to be positive definite, okay? So if this is full rank and capital N is of course generally much larger than small n, so because you might have multiple data points, like millions of data points, but you only have 100 parameters or so to fit. So this matrix is going to be uh, positive definite. So remember we were talking about this DK term, right? So this is used to be, this term used to be DK. And this DK is something that we can pick, right? This is still the gradient, right? So gradient doesn't change, but this DK is something that I can pick and if, if I pick the second derivative inverse, then I get this, uh, then I get the Newton's method. But one of your friends said that he's lazy, but he wants to be fast. So he wants to omit this term, computation of this term. So what we get is the, uh, is the algorithm for solving least square problem, which is, So we retain the, uh, the fast convergence properties of Newton's method because we are computing some part of the second derivative inverse while uh, making sure that it is a valid descent direction. This is a positive definite inverse matrix, which is completely fine. Yes. Uh, so that's what we are trying to do. We are omitting the summation part so that we don't have to compute the second derivative at all. See, as long as this particular matrix is uh, uh, a positive definite matrix, you are completely fine. It's still a valid gradient descent algorithm. Remember what the gradient descent algorithm was? It's uh, xk plus 1 equals to xk minus alpha k dk gradient of fxk. So I can pick dk, I can pick any positive definite matrix I want. As long as this positive definite matrix is close to the second derivative inverse, I'm fine. So by omitting this term, 
I'm making sure that it is still close to the second derivative inverse, but it's not exactly equal to second derivative inverse. Now, it will be equal to second derivative inverse if this was 0, right? If the second derivative was 0, then of course it's an exact expression. But that would require, so second derivative being 0 requires gi to be a linear function. Only then the second derivative will be 0. So if gi is linear, this is an exact Newton's method. If gi is nonlinear, then of course this term is uh, non zero, but sometimes it could be negligible. So in that case also it's uh, close to Newton's method. If this is non negligible, then this is just an approximate Newton's method. It's not a Newton's method because it's not second derivative inverse, but it is an approximation to the Newton's method. So it lies somewhere between, the, the speed of convergence lies somewhere between steepest descent method and Newton's method, okay? So it lies somewhere in the middle. So that's how generally you come up with new algorithms, derivative algorithms on the basis of uh, the gradient descent algorithm. So you can pick dk, as long as dk is positive definite, you are fine. So you can pick dk as like you can exploit the structure of the problem as we are doing here to get an approximate value of dk which will work for your problem. Okay. Any other questions? Did I miss anything else? Oh yeah, one thing. Uh, so sometimes it might be the case that when you are doing this second derivative, when you're doing this uh, matrix, matrix transpose inverse, then some of the eigenvalues of this matrix could be close to zero. Could be, in some cases, it could be close to zero, in which case this inverse would make those eigenvalues very large and will make your algorithm very unstable, okay? So in those cases, what you generally do is you add I don't know, some lambda bar i inverse. So you add an identity matrix with some multiplier so as to ensure that this still remains positive definite matrix. So this is still a positive definite matrix. This is still an approximation to the Newton's method. Okay, and then you take the inverse. So that way you remove all the ill conditioning that could have happened if this had eigenvalues closer to zero. So that's just a small change that you will have to make in your code in case you are coding this algorithm. Uh, that if this matrix inverse is giving some errors, giving some eigenvalue issues, just add a small identity matrix, like a small multiplier times the identity matrix, and then it'll start working completely fine. This method has a name. Uh, levenberg marquardt method, uh, but uh, it's not that important to remember the name. So that's all I have for today. Oh yeah. It can have eigenvalues zero. So the inverse may have then inverse may have issues. Yeah, you might. It could even have like eigenvalues may not be zero, but it could be 0 0.01. Then again, you invert it, the matrix inverts, and then one of the eigenvalues become 100. That becomes a problem. It adds instability to the optimization algorithm. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Homework one is out, so please start working on it. It's due next Monday.